All right. So um, we're uh, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. We're going um, over the lessons in leadership by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. And um, this week is De Devarim. Um, and the title is The Leader as Teacher. And we kind of touched on this er in an earlier, in an earlier um, parasha, um, speaking of uh, how good teachers are or the differences between a, a, a leader of um, power as, a, as opposed to influence and that kind of thing. But this time it's just um, about just how Moshe um, became more of a teacher at the end of his life um, than not really the, this, he wasn't really um, commanding everybody. He was just teaching everyone at the end. Um, so, uh, said for the last month of his life, he assembled the people and delivered a series of addresses we know as a book of De Deuteronomy or Devarim, literally words. So um, he had he um, he gave his um, power or his command over to Yehoshua, and then and Moshe himself started teaching teaching the people. Um, and what he taught them, um, he taught them to see themselves as a holy people, Am 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 Kodesh. Uh, the only people whose sovereign and whose sovereign and the lawgiver was God Himself. So, um, you know, maybe the other other nations around them that had had these various leaders or rulers um, that gave the laws, but they were a people that, you know, or we are a people that could always claim that um, that our God gave us our laws, not not some man. You know? And then Rabbi Jonathan. Um, Sachs uh, mentions a, this TED talk done by Simon Sinek, which I never watched, but um, he, he said that the title of this uh, TED talk was called Start, Start With Why. Um, um, so trans, transformative, transformative leaders always um, start with why. And um, in Deuteronomy, Mo, Moshe gives the people their why. And um, their why is they are God's people, the nation on whom he has set his love, the people he rescued from slavery and gave in the form of commandments, the constitution of liberty. So, um, so why, you know, why do you want to, um, I guess, what, what is your mission in a sense, or why, or why you exist? You know, this, this is the reason why you exist. This is the reason why, why you're here on this earth, because you're God's people and and um, he did all these things for you, and, and he even gave you the Torah. So you got to like you know, step up kind of thing. Um, in the last month of his life, Moshe um, ceased to be the liberator, the miracle worker, the redeemer, and became instead Moshe Rabbeinu, the Mo Moses, our teacher. Um, um, so as we know, like when, when a leader becomes a teacher, um, um, it's kind of like he passes on um, all the things that he knows to everybody, not just not just to one person. You know, he did pass on his authority over to Yehoshua, but by teaching all the people um, all that all that he knows, he essentially passed on himself on to everybody. You know, um, um, and there's another um, uh, another nice quote says, "When leaders become educators, they change lives." So. Um, um, instead of just commanding people, you're actually changing people. It's kind of like that to teach a man, teach a man to fish kind of thing, and then he becomes a fisherman by himself. Um, um, so Rabbi um, Joseph Sol Solo Solovechik um, wrote this essay. It's called Who is Fit to Lead the Jewish People? And he contrasts the Jewish attitude to kings as opposed to teachers um, and in the essay i guess it kind of you know, to sum it up it's more it's like he um like kings were like kind of just a, a little bit above people and more like they they couldn't they, there's all these rules that the torah sets for kings you know they couldn't have a bunch of wives they couldn't have um they can't think of themselves better than anybody else so in a sense they're kind of just like 
someone who's just kind of a director as opposed to like the, the kings of like the other nations who kind of have sole authority or rule over everything kind of thing. Um, but in, in Judaism, our teachers are like the, are set up um, really high at a high regard. You know, we, we, um, we love our teachers. Um, the Talmud says, let the fear of your teacher be as the fear of heaven. And um, Rambam teaches um, to respect that respect and reverence for your teacher should be greater than even the respect and reverence for your parents. Um, because parents bring you into this world um, while teachers give you entrance to the world to come. So um, as parents, we should also be teachers so that we could get to that same level. Because no. <laughs> uh, we don't want to, you know, we don't want teachers to have more respect than us. So we have to teach our children as well. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's understandable, you know, to that how, how much teachers um, impact people. Um, and then the last little part here, um, it talks about how teachers are the acknowledged builders of the future. Um, and if a leader, if, and if a leader seeks to make lasting change, he or she must follow the footsteps of Moshe and become an educator. The leader as teacher using influence rather than power, power, spiritual and intellectual authority rather than coercive force um, was one of the greatest contributions to Judaism ever made to be the moral horizons of humankind. So um, let us, as leaders of our, of our families, as leaders of uh, maybe in work or wherever you are, uh, let us continue to um, teach those that we have influence over so that they can um, carry on um, the truth that we know, the Torah that we know, and that will, you know, that we, this world a better place. That's all I have uh, today. So, this portion, you know, this is, this is uh, Shabbat Chazon which, you know, this is the Shabbat before Tisha B'Av, and this is where we always read this, this last Haftorah with Isaiah, uh, the vision of Isaiah, that's what kind of it's named after. But uh, we get two allusions actually to Tisha B'Av in this. Uh, the sin of the spies is talked about in this portion, and it said that the sin of the spies was actually given on the night of Tisha B'Av. And uh, like, I guess, yeah. And basically, um, Moshe is telling them, about first he draws this connection between appointing judges and uh the sin of the spies mm -hmm. and i was listening to a, a teaching by Aleph beta i don't know if i completely agree with it but it was drawing a thing that moses has drawn this line and basically what, it, what it's showing is basically the the pattern that israel has gone through at least his first generation where they're given these judges. I mean, he, he's like, I can't, I couldn't take the constant bickering, all the different stuff. And so I assigned these, these judges, you know, he said it was good. And we, we did this thing. Uh, basically, he then talks about, uh, he wanted then these, these uh, people to go out and scout the land. And, but their, their response again was the bickering and, the, and the not wanting to do what, what Hashem wanted them to do. And it's like, after they'd been through all this, all this stuff, all this, these different things, he's really led them out. He's given them food when they complained. I mean, all the above and beyond stuff, really. He's been there the entire time and they still have an issue and cannot do what they're told to do. You know, and it's, it's just bringing out this concept that, you know, what is faith? Is faith do we, do we bring faith down into something that it is something that is you just believe and that's it or is it you really need to do something you know your your actions should show that you really are doing god's will you're believing in god's will and you're doing the, the right things for you and the community and everything and so um i think that's a big connection with this after a portion because when you get in there obviously you know hashem's talking about things that he set up if you do these things, it's like offensive to me. Although we know later on in, in the book, it actually, he actually says the opposite. You need to do these things, you know? But a lot of people might take this and think, oh, you know, he's like saying that there's no more of these things or whatever the case is. But it's not the case. What he's really pointing out is that, uh, 
these things without the without the right aspect of, I guess, real faith is completely lacking in his eyes. So in this, you know, obviously he says, you know, the, your new moons, your fixed seasons, they fill me with, with loathing. They become burdened to me. But when you lift up your hands, I will turn away my eyes from you. But you pray at length that when I listen. So then he says, wash yourself clean, put away your evil doings from my sight. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, devote yourselves to justice, aid the wrong, uphold the rights of the orphan, defend the cause of the widow. Come, let us reach an understanding. Though your sins are like crimson, they can turn snow white. And as red as they are, they can be become like fleece. So it's really just drawing out this. I think the, the big element that stuck out to me in this portion was the concept of real faith, uh, you know, and may we really start to demonstrate that in our own lives and affect the world, you know, and the real aspect of Tukun Alam, you know, that's performing the mitzvot and doing the things that we need to do, going above and beyond. Bat shalom. Two weeks ago, I posted something online that many of you have, may have seen on Facebook. It was a conversation that I had with Yaron, my six-year-old son. Yaron likes to watch uh, History Channel programs on uh, ancient Egypt, biblical history. He's very profound for a six-year-old, very stubborn, uh, but very, very profound. And he began to ask me questions about life after death. And so I found myself having this late-night conversation with him. Um, and as we continued, uh, the, the subject of my mother, of blessed memory, came up. And uh, in the midst of this, uh, Yaron said something very profound, and I began to weep when he said this. And the reason I mention this is because I hadn't wept for my mother for about a year and a half. You know, it's, it's been about two and a half years, because this is the natural uh, process of mourning, right? God forbid, lo aleinu that anybody should lose a child. I think that's probably the only exception that I can think of, but the normal process is that as time passes, you, uh, you know, you sort of the, the, the scar, you know, the wound heals, you remember, you see the scar, if you will, emotionally, but you sort of process it and then you continue. If that is the healthy approach to mourning, then why do we as a people grow through this very extensive process of mourning for the Beit HaMikdash? Not only one day, three weeks, and of course, there are many different minchagim and different halachot regarding the observances, uh, you know, not listening to live music, not eating meat, or depending on when you start. Uh, I mean, this week we have sort of an odd situation because it's pushed out to Sunday, but in general, not cutting your hair, shaving, uh, not having the intimacy with your spouse, you know, beginning tonight, the fast. It's, it's sort of bizarre if you think about it, because in many ways we put so much emphasis on that, that it actually over... Uh, whelms what we put into Yom Kippur, right? It's only one day. And if you look at his, historically, if you look at people groups who have suffered tragedies in their lives as a people, sometimes those people groups become so consumed with the tragedies that they have gone through that they're imprisoned by those experiences. Uh, and they don't, they're not able to move on beyond that. They sort of seem stuck in time. And yes, there, there can be legitimate reasons why they sort of bring these things up, but they're not living the exact, you know, uh, experiences of their forefathers and their foremothers. So why do we as a people do that? Well, the reason, according to Rabbi Baruch Gelman, is that the lack of the Beit HaMikdash is not a normal status in the world. You know, obviously, when the patriarch stood the Avot, uh, there wasn't a Beit HaMikdash, but there were the Korbanot, there were the sacrifices that they offered to Hashem. And as a consequence, they sort of stood there, if you will, as the uh, in the gap for the Beit HaMikdash, uh, but now we don't have a Beit HaMikdash. And so the whole system of Kedushah, of holiness, and order has been set and thrown uh, awry. Uh, why do we say that? Because when you read, you know, you, you read uh, Vayikra, you read the Tanakh in general, holiness, Kedushah, stems from the Beit HaMikdash. It flows out to Jerusalem. It goes out to the land of Israel, and then it proceeds from there. And so when the Beit HaMikdash is missing, the whole system is thrown into chaos, and we're left in a world that as, you know, as today, where good is called evil, and evil is called good, and everything is set in, in turmoil. Now, if we read the book of Ezekiel, we know that uh, there's a statement that says that the name of Hashem is blasphemed among the nations because the people of Israel have been scattered uh, throughout the world. Now, Rabbi Baruch Gelman relates a statement by Rabbi Greenberg that says, 
our understanding of that is contrary to the, the Peshat, you know, the standard reading of the text. Because if you think about it, if the children of Israel are exiled throughout the world, in, in as painful as it may be for us, uh, Hashem is, is verifying, he's validating his word, right? Uh, if you sin, I'm going to cast you to the ends of the earth. And if an individual is able to read the, the scripture, they're going to say, you know what? I may not follow that God, but he sort of carries out what he says. You know, he, he was true to his word. And that's why we find Jews in almost every country. But what Rabbi Baruch Galman says is, uh, in, in uh, quoting Rabbi Greenberg, is that there's a twist on the comment about Hashem's name being blasphemed. Because if the nations were to say, look at the Jews, they are being punished because they were disobedient, that would be one thing. But the reality is that, especially today, what, they, what we find is that they say, no, the Jews are no longer Hashem's people, and he has rejected them, and that is why he is in, they are in the diaspora, that is why Israel is under attack. This is why this is something that continues on, even despite all of the uh, uh, progress that has been made uh, among Christians with respect to supersessionism, replacement theology. It always comes up. It always is an issue that uh, is never completely resolved. And so in that sense, the name of Hashem is actually blasphemed because the nations are failing to acknowledge that Hashem is not through with B'nai Yisrael. And so in the midst of this, what Rabbi Baruch Gelman says is that even if the people of Israel are not worthy to be redeemed, even if we are incapable of meeting some type of uh, achieving unity, even if we are not able to live up to the standard that he has stated in the Torah, because of his holy name and because of the injustice that is being done to his name, he will respond on behalf of the people of Israel. And so when we observe Tisha B'Av, we have sort of a, a challenge because on the one hand, we're supposed to be mournful. We're supposed to weep. We're supposed to remember the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, both of them, the exiles, all the things that have happened. But at the same time, we are to take a measure of joy because as Stephen said, when we fail to observe the, uh, the, the holidays, the Hagim, all these things, we don't have the right attitude. They are for the wrong reason, right? I hate your Shabbatot, your holidays, yours, because they become yours. But when we have a measure of joy, and it's odd, right? Because we're mixing joy and grief. When Hashem sees that we are taking our time and devoting ourselves to the memory to rectify the things that our forefathers have done, these things sort of turn his heart and they face, you know, makes him face himself towards the people of Israel. The, uh, the Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, in uh, I think it's Barachot 59a, says that uh, Hashem uh, weeps for the destruction of the temple so much so that his tears fall into the great sea, which is the Mediterranean. And when he does so, it sort of reverberates throughout the entire world. Because he knows that in essence, there is a gap, there is a, a, a fissure that has been uh, created between the people of the world, uh, mediated through, through the people of Israel, and his presence. Because of course, we, you know, the, the Midrash says that his, uh, the Shekhinah went into the exile with us. So he is incomplete in that sense. And he looks forward to the day, as we, we recited the Elenu, where his name will be one, right? His, his, his name and his presence, everything will be unified. Uh, so as we go into the fast tonight, uh, try to combine those two elements. Rejoice in the fact that you are aware of the sufferings of our people. Mourn because there are many who, people of Israel, most of us, unfortunately, are not committed to Hashem. Uh, but rejoice because we have a, a God that is faithful and he sees the sufferings of his people uh, and he takes note of that. And so may Hashem grant us the ability to repent as we sort of, again, transition to a new part of the year. Uh, and then we begin to look forward to the high holidays and may he grant us uh, success and may he build the Beit HaMikdash in our days. You, you, you got a break this week. <laughs>